The Wicked Library is not intended for sensitive listeners. If you're a sensitive listener, listen very closely. Are you ready? Of course you are, sweetheart. Stop listening to the bloody show! You're sensitive! This could be very harmful to your mental capacity! <laughs> Why are you still listening? I just said it wasn't intended for you. You're not going to have fun here. You're going to have nightmares. And we, your kecks. Yes, you will. <laughs> Listen to discretion is advised. Society 13 Podcast Network. Redefining Podcasts. Society-13.com I like to listen. Welcome to Channel 9 of the STRY Radio Network, where stories live. Hello. And welcome back to the Wicked Library for episode number 716. Before we get started today, I want to quickly say thank you to our new Patreon supporters. They help keep the show coming by helping us cover all our costs. And more importantly, a lot of time and love goes into making the show. And it's nice to see your support. It means a lot to know that the show means enough to you to actually throw a little bit of cash our way. So a big thank you to Bobby Brooks. Alex, Marcel Ward, and Gavino Aguayo for editing your pledge from $5 to $20. That means a lot. Thanks so much for that. And I apologize if I murdered any of your names, which I'm sure I probably did. If you'd like to support the show, that's right, you listener, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash wicked library. If you support the show for as little as $2 a month, you'll get a completely ad-free show as well as access to our archive with the first five seasons of the show. That's over 70 extra shows, and we're always finding one or two here and there in the old archives that haven't seen the light of day for quite a while. So normally I add about one of those a month whenever I find a new one. At the $5 a month and above level, you get a bonus story each month, a brand new one. These bonus stories will eventually be heard here in quarterly anthology episodes, but hey, who wants to wait for that? April's bonus story was written by Tyler Woodsmall and featured narration by Addison Peacock of the fantastic No Sleep podcast. And May's bonus story, The Pit, was written by Meg Hofdahl and features narration by Jessica McAvoy, also a regular on the No Sleep podcast. Also, a big thank you to those who took the time to rate and review us on iTunes. Your reviews help keep us on the charts and help people find us, so that's definitely appreciated. This week, I'd like to share a couple of those new reviews with you, and you'll hear the rest at the end of the show. So, from the United States, five stars from Squid238, wonderful horror fiction podcast. The Wicked Library is one of my favorite horror fiction podcasts. The librarian says you mean it's your favorite horror fiction podcast, right? Of course. From the opening to the stories to the author interviews, this is everything I was looking for in a podcast. Keep up the great work, and thank you for all you do. Well, thank you for taking the time to rate and review the show and for being a listener. Canada sends us one, a five-star review from New Spank. I like it. Love. Just recently found your podcast. Love the stories and interviews. They help get me through the horror story that is my life. Stay-at-home mom to six kids. LOL. Well, first of all, congratulations on having a sense of humor about it, because I don't know if I could type LOL if I had six kids at home. That's quite a few. I feel for you. Also, I want to give a special shout-out to at Terry for all the love on Twitter. And... Again, thanks so much to everyone who listens and supports the show, whether it's through your ratings and reviews or financially by supporting us on Patreon, or maybe even just telling a friend or some weird guy on the bus about us. It's definitely appreciated. If you enjoy the interviews at the end of the show, check out the Ninth Story podcast, 
with Jeanette and Alexander for more interviews and discussions with storytellers of all types. And now, let's get wicked. Hello, kiddies. Have a seat and relax. I'm your librarian. There's nothing to be afraid of, yet. Hold on to yourselves, boils and ghouls. This is going to be a dark ride. We'll leave the lights on for now. No talking. It's story time at the Wicked Library. <laughs> Today's episode of the Wicked Library is actually a special episode. This is one of the tracks from the upcoming Shadows at the Door anthology, which is going to be available in Audible soon. Our friend Mark Nixon asked me to be a part of the anthology, so I actually wrote a story for it, as well as narrated many of the tracks, along with my good friend and the executive producer for the show, Cynthia Lohman. We'll have more details for you as they become available. You can always check out shadowsatthedoor.com. If you can't wait for that upcoming audiobook, you can pick up the hardcover at shadowsatthedoor.com. Maybe get both. We hope you enjoy today's presentation featuring a custom score by our friends Sean Park and Kimberly Henninger of Cathedral Sounds. Cover art by Barney Baduano, who does all the illustrations for the book. And, of course, the story today by Mark Nixon, narrated by yours truly. So sit back, relax, and be wary of what might be lurking in the shadows at the door. Quem Infernos by Mark Nixon A single chime pierced the ambient noise of the so-called quiet carriage as a smothered voice informed the passengers of their imminent arrival at Durham Station. Chinnery carefully closed his paperback and placed it into the leather satchel nestled between his feet. Through the window, the racing of terrace rooftops began to slow. Beyond the cobbled streets, church towers, and meandering river, Durham Cathedral stood proudly, looking down upon the town while its gothic spires climbed up into a dull, an almost completely white sky. It was huge and dominating in its majesty. Chinnery rubbed the condensation from the window and stared at it, almost hypnotized. It stared back at him. He eventually left his seat and padded out the creases in his trousers. He felt the train come to a stop, causing him to sway forward in perfect sync with the rest of the standees. The cold was waiting for him outside and he maneuvered his way to the exit. The doors hissed and rolled open. Chinnery hung back until the flow of departing passengers had ebbed and stepped onto the platform. The crisp air rushed to him, quickly wrapping itself around his body and settling deeply in his chest. He was barely through the barriers when the conductor's whistle heralded the train's exodus to its next stop, Newcastle. His business, in fact, lay there the next day. But so rarely was he called up north that an irresistible opportunity to explore had presented itself. After all, his last visit to the northeast had ended up in a sleepless night in a damp room opposite what must have been Newcastle's most popular kebab house. Chinnery accepted as many speaking engagements as he could each year, adding a comfortable supplement to his modest income, and he preferred to bill the host the next day, as opposed to being assigned accommodation. Trains had always been his preferred mode of transport. He could enjoy the lack of phone signal for a few precious hours and would often find himself gazing out of the window, a window seat being his only demand when traveling. These moments allowed him time to process his thoughts, and, after all, he'd had some of his best ideas on trains. Had it not have been for an unusually laborious train journey to Cardiff in 2006, he'd have never concocted a credible way to kill one of his longest-suffering protagonists. 
Having never seen Durham, beyond fleeting glances on his way to other destinations, Chinnery had always imagined that it must be a far more civilized place than its neighbors. The students alone would no doubt be better behaved. An afternoon in the historic city would serve him quite nicely, followed by a stay in a hotel room that was typically still 20 pounds away from maxing out his budget. He quickly came to love the place, its narrow cobbled alleyways, ancient stonework, and how the old buildings looked as though they'd been reaching for each other over the last hundred years. The window panes warped from the strain. Chinnery's only problem with the city, he soon realized, was the endless rise and fall of the narrow streets. Rarely did it offer level ground, and he was forever either half-jogging against gravity down a steep hill or trudging his way up another, and was ashamed to admit that he was out of breath before the viaduct was out of sight. Unfortunately for him, the cathedral stood atop the highest of these points. The streets began to taper as he neared the grounds, and after one final desperate summit, he reached the palace green, the grassy tip of the peninsula that lay before the cathedral. For a moment, he stared up at the old monastery in silence. Though magnificent, it looked almost dingy against the dull sky. The stained glass windows were dark, seeming to suck in and devour the light rather than casting out its once resplendent colors. It now looked very much different than it had from the train windows of so many journeys gone by. He ambled slowly around the verdant area. The smell of moist earth was strong, a reminder that the damp and cold air would surely take its toll unless he went inside soon. The cobble soon gave way to pavement, and as he passed the surrounding gravestones, he began to feel as if the cathedral was growing in size. It practically rose with his every step until the towers themselves loomed over him. No longer the mere backdrop to the city, the cathedral was an architectural colossus, ready to completely envelop him. One of the main doors stood open. On the other was a bulky and grotesque door knocker, an unsettling bronze cast of a lion's head with large hollow eyes above a series of wrinkle-like lines to the side of a very human nose. In its large toothed jaw, it gripped the knocker itself. The gargoyle's very presence looked alien upon the huge wooden door, and though its accompanying sign referred to it as Sanctuary Door Knocker, it seemed more frightening than comforting. Why anyone would feel at ease grasping the handle of the dreaded thing, Chinnery had no clue. Chinnery had expected a sense of grandeur inside the cathedral, but the vastness of the interior was something quite else. The nave was dominated by huge carved pillars of stone, each decorated in intricate geometric patterns that spiraled upwards until they turned and met the ceiling, where they spilled over into a sea of crosses. Gazing up at them was enough to induce a state of vertigo upon the visiting author, and he steadied himself as he began to sway backwards just to take them all in. The windows above the pillars were encased in stone arches, their stained glass panes echoing a dim glow, but no efficient light. Instead, the majority of the light was provided by spotlights. The cathedral's acoustics betrayed its seemingly empty interior as the hushed murmurs of forty or so voices rolled over the stone, collecting in a strident hum. Walking softly down the main aisle, Chinnery tried his best not to disturb the few visitors who knelt in prayer. Even the most lax of Christians must feel compelled to drop to their knees in such a place, he thought. He stepped up to the choir area, where the stalls and pews were of a much darker wood, decorated with gothic spikes and spires. Chinnery had always had an eye for gothic design and would have studied them further were he not suddenly enticed by the decadently embellished tomb beyond them. Atop the tomb lay the stone likeness of the deceased inhabitant. A crown on his head, he appeared regal and dignified, despite having lost his nose to the passage of time or careless hands. The tomb's sides were decorated in a dazzling array of gold, blue, red, and gray hues, dutifully repainted as time went on. 
As he examined the variety of coats of arms, Shinnery noticed that they, too, had fallen victim to a spot of vandalism. Scratched under one of the shields was a series of letters, the edges of which had eroded over hundreds of years. The fact that they appeared to be in Latin only cemented his assumptions. Quem infra nos est ne obliviscere. His historical novels often called for Latin, and as such, after a moment, he was able to fumble a translation. Forget not who is below us. Though he spent a good few hours wandering through the cloisters and chapels of the cathedral, he could find nothing quite so mysterious as the words etched into the tomb. The cathedral had many tales to tell, several of them of particular interest, but nothing as unusual or ambiguous as the scratched message. Refusing to leave without satisfying his curiosity, Chinnery returned to the choir, and for his troubles, he was greeted by the sight of one of the cathedral's many vergers. From first glance, it was clear that the verger was living out his retirement. He rested his somewhat bulky frame onto a black cane, which caught a great deal of glare on its finely varnished wood. The silver-haired man smiled slightly at Chinnery's approach, turning to greet him. He was eager to answer questions, specifically those about the scratched Latin. So, you're interested in the story of Canon Nicholas Verne? It was more a statement than a question. Chinnery opened his mouth to say that he wasn't, but sensed his question was about to be answered, albeit the long way. You've got a good eye. Most people assume it's just graffiti, although I suppose in its own way it is. He eyed Chinnery appraisingly. So, you read Latin? I dabble, Chinnery answered honestly. The verger smiled, satisfied, and then turned to the tomb. Quem infra nos est ne obliviscere, or forget not who is below us. I admit, it interested me for some time. Any mention of a third party often refers to God in places of worship, and you'll notice that the inscriber opted for the masculine Quem, but no one would speak of the Lord in such disregard. Tell me, what were your initial thoughts? I'm not really sure. I can't imagine it refers to the devil or anything like that. No, the verger interrupted. Not the devil. Chinnery looked to him for further comment, before realizing he would have to prize the answer out of the old man. Then what? The verger's eyes fixed on Chinnery. His irises were milky, yet intense. It's not a well-known fact, and it's hard to explain without backing it up, because otherwise you wouldn't believe me. Do you mind if I show you something? Chinnery supposed every volunteer here had a secret theory or two about the place, and decided to entertain the idea. By all means. The verger left and was gone for some minutes, and in the absence of the conversation, the area was unusually still, save for the rattle of air Chinnery could feel somewhere behind him. It seemed the heating system could only prevent so much of the draft. While he waited, he discreetly took a few photographs of the area on his phone. If this whole exercise unearthed something of interest, then he could very well use some details in his next novel. While he'd enjoyed moderate success for about ten years now, he was beginning to feel as if he'd mined most of his ideas. These days, his stories required a great deal more inspiration. He scrawled a few notes into his ever-present notepad before returning it to his satchel, and by the time he was done, he could see the verger stepping through the choir with a couple of notebooks in hand. Chinnery was guided down into the main aisle, and there they took a seat in one of the pews. The verger set the notebooks between them, but did not offer any immediate explanation. He sat down with his back to a pillar, making sure that he was not within earshot of anyone else before beginning. The theater of all the secrecy was beginning to amuse the author, 
but he said nothing for fear of causing offense. So, he began, the biggest clue is what lies directly in front of the message itself. It took me some time to figure it out, actually. The above spotlights revealed the true extent of the dark circles around his eyes. Chinnery nodded. Did you spot the large rug in front of the tomb? The verger let the words hang, awaiting a reply. I did. Under it rests one of our less popular bishops, Louis de Beaumont. I won't get too much into him, but he was only appointed thanks to a great deal of nepotism. He was pretty useless by all accounts, as anyone here will tell you, but that's no secret. What is this? He stopped and lowered his voice, leaning forward. What is a secret is that they found a more suitable purpose for the tomb in time. That is to say, our friend Lewis is not alone down there. Chinnery raised his eyebrows. Forget not who is below us. It's literal, a grave marker. Precisely. So why all the secrecy then? The verger leaned back. Why else? The scandals, secrets, and hush things. <sighs> he sighed. So, what do you know about the rites of sanctuary? Well, Chinnery began, a little frustrated to have another question answered with a question. I read earlier that the door knocker was used by local criminals to claim sanctuary for 30 days or so, or something along those lines. More or less, the verger replied. Only the most serious crimes, though. So it was common for thieves and murderers to reside here for a spell, only to be shipped off to pastures new once they've received their forgiveness from God. So this has something to do with one of these criminals? Not quite. The verger looked down the aisle. Chinnery was unsure whether he was focused on the choir or if he was simply staring into empty space. It took me so long to find out who else was buried there, you know, he said, and then began trailing off. When he spoke again, he seemed to be speaking to himself. The priests wanted nothing to do with it, but I found it. So who is it? The funny thing is, it's nobody special. Who? The verger shifted his attention back to Chinnery, and he gestured to the notebooks. I'll let him introduce himself. He offered the notebooks to Chinnery. All somber notes had left his voice. I'd love to get your thoughts on this whole thing. It's a relief to talk to someone about it, really. A uh, relief? Chinnery asked, incredulous. The verger rubbed a hand over his chin. Well, it's as I said. No other person here wanted to hear about it. You're the first to share any interest since I found out myself. Please, have a look at them and tell me what you think tomorrow night. I might have something special to show you then. He almost declined. After all, he could easily have said his interest didn't go that far but they both would have known that it was a lie. Besides, despite what the verger had tried to hide, the man seemed relieved to share his research, as though he was unburdening himself. So Chinnery took the notebooks with a smile and promised to return the following evening. There was a subtle change in the air. It was just as cold as the day before, but now... There lay glints of ice patterned throughout the streets. The dull glow of the sun had passed the main tower of the cathedral and now touched those on the western side. Their shadows crawled along the ground as Chinnery walked away. He would be glad to enjoy a cup of tea inside the presumably well-heated bed and breakfast. His room was snug and welcoming, boasting a view of the river and the cathedral itself. There was no carpet but instead laminated flooring 
which seemed to slope as Chinnery walked across it, his footsteps no doubt disturbing anyone below. Although he had intended to shower and venture out for a good meal, he was surprised at the sheer relief that washed over his tired body as he settled onto the mattress. He contemplated switching on the television, but instead reached for his satchel and removed the notebooks that the verger had been so keen for him to borrow. He opened the notebook and looked at the flyleaf, which was written in scraggly handwriting. I fear these words have now become confession. Let it be said that I tried to perform my earthly duties, and I have failed. Now it is upon him to decide my ultimate fate. The text was dated 1539, and the words, Rough Translation, underlined above the page heavily, and indeed a great deal of pages before it. Clearly, the verger had intended to share these notes one day, as the odd note of explanation was dotted throughout. As Chinnery scanned back through the transcripts, he saw a frequent crossing out of words as translations were corrected. It became quickly apparent that the majority of the texts were a translation of the writings of one Canon Nicholas Verne. For a good many years leading to the final entry, it appeared that Verne had served the cathedral with a passion that bordered on fanaticism. Initially, even for an avid reader such as himself, he found reading the canon's worship downright tiresome, with the noticeable exception of a considerable amount of space in his journals filled with disparaging musings on the others in the cathedral and their true commitment. But even those lost their entertainment value after a while. Just as Chinnery was about to declare the entire venture a waste of time, events came into play near the journal's end that changed its nature completely. It seemed that as the reformation of the 16th century reached Durham, Verne became preoccupied, obsessed even, with keeping St. Cuthbert's treasures within the cathedral. It is very weak, perhaps wicked, to write such things, yet I cannot stand by and let this desecration pass. Though I scarcely have the courage, I must remove what Cromwell seeks before they are within his grasp. I will need help, and yet I cannot turn to my brothers. Some days later, a new entry revealed the extent of his desperation. It is an unclean business. Perhaps that is why my efforts have been met with such misfortune. The day before yesterday, I met with a local man of disrepute, and I must admit, speaking to him unsettled me greatly. Yet... He did speak of his reverence for the cathedral and his distaste of the king. Now I realize he was merely attempting to sound sweet to my ears, but an agreement was made, one which may have sealed my fate. He was to arrive today, seeking the right of sanctuary and assist in taking St. Cuthbert's treasures out of the grounds for safekeeping, minus his fee, of course. And, indeed, he did arrive yesterday. Yet, we were aware of his approach before he even got to the knocker. Oh, how he walked jauntily to the doors. A whistle upon his lips and a smile across his wretched face. The blood still wet upon his hands. He spoke of mere theft, not the taking of a life. The peace about him chills my bones still. There is never dismay upon his face, nor remorse. And now the damned man is but in the neighboring room, calmly eating while wearing dear St. Cuthbert's cross. This is not what I had planned, not what was meant to be. I grow tired of seeing the scoundrel lurk the corridors. Forever he is gleaming, waiting for this moment. I can hardly stand it. Suppose I were to go away from here. Surely I would be hunted once they discovered the truth. Yet to leave without Cuthbert's treasures would defy the purpose of these events. No, I must endure. Surely this is but a test? A later entry was marked in the notebook with a folded corner. Morning, 
noon and night I am haunted, haunted by the fear that the Lord will witness my fall before the deed is finished. The criminal has vanished from this place, a betrayer forevermore, and so I am alone in my endeavors now. Once today I ventured to the cloisters, the eyes of my brothers were upon me. Without parting their lips, they told me of their knowledge, of their judgment, as if they had the right. Curse my brothers for this. Curse their wretched souls. For this entry, the verger had underlined the words cursed, an indentation so deep, Chinnery was amazed that the page hadn't torn. A few turns of the page later, Chinnery came across the final entry, which he had first seen upon opening the notepads. The Confession On the opposite page, the verger had gone on to write the probability of events that followed, but one certainty was recorded. Canon Nicholas Verne was hanged on the authority of the Crown on the 2nd of March, 1539. The execution was performed outside the grounds of the cathedral, presumably after he had attempted to escape with the treasures in hand. Vern may have damned his brothers at the cathedral, yet they thought enough of him to bury him within the existing tomb under the cathedral choir, despite his desperate transgressions, despite his curses. Quem infra nost est ne oblivisker, Chinnery whispered. It made sense to him now, and he began to feel rather pleased that he had not relented in his curiosity. Nevertheless, as the end of the night drew near, his need for full closure grew more and more acute. As no answers could come until morning, he put the notebook aside and instead reached for his own notepad and began to jot down the basic details of his new discovery. It occurred to him that when he opened the floor to questions at his talk tomorrow, someone would inevitably ask him where he got his ideas. Usually, he answered with a coy smile and offered a polite anecdote. But now, he was experiencing exactly what they expected, a plot practically falling into his lap. A few name changes here, a sexy affair thrown in there, and he just about had the beginning of a new novel. However, despite his enthusiasm, the words on the page began to blur and no amount of eye-rubbing would alleviate it. Although he was not aware he was falling asleep, it wasn't long before Chinnery slipped into a dream. It took some time for the image of the cathedral to form in his subconscious, but it was the gothic spires that appeared first, rising from the ground and into a blood-red sky. He was outside staring up at it as he had before, but this time was different. He looked at his hands. They, like the rest of the world around him, were tinged with a dark scarlet hue. It were as if someone had wrapped the sun in red cloth. Eve! cried a voice behind, causing him to spin around. Two men pulled on a rope that was draped tightly over a huge tree branch. The other end was a noose tied around the neck of a man draped in robes that did not belong to this time. Vern. He let out a sharp, surprised choke as he was lifted higher from the ground. His arms flailed briefly before he focused their efforts and reached for the rope around his neck. But his attempts were useless, and after a while his arms lost their strength and fell to his sides but the poor soul was not dead yet. Eve, repeated the voice, and this time, Chinnery noticed a third man clad in armor some feet away from the tree. He looked remarkably like one of the characters from his books. The two men tugged on the rope again, one allowing his entire weight to pull on it as he lifted his legs from under him. Chinnery looked back to the disgraced cannon, and was taken aback to see the dying eyes locked directly onto his. Vern's eyes bulged out of their sockets, and even in the red tint of the unnatural dream world, Chinnery could tell the man's eyes were their own deep shade of crimson. Chinnery felt accused. The 
hate in Vern's eyes was unbearable. The man had served his God, tried to protect his temple, his saint, and what had been his reward? An agonizing death. Somehow, Vern seemed to blame him. I'm sorry, Chinnery said. In response, Vern slowly opened his mouth, but only a rattle of a choke was heard. The sound was so terrible, so drawn out, that Chinnery flinched and covered his ears. And then the body was limp, the eyes wide. Chinnery woke up abruptly, convinced somebody was in the room with him. Hello, he called. No answer. The wind sighed through the trees outside his window, rustling the leaves softly. He pushed his glasses up his nose, having fallen asleep without removing them, and outside he saw the branches wave at him. He sat up, shaking slightly, and walked to the window to draw the curtains. Through the movement of the branches, he saw the tip of the main stone tower of the cathedral, bathed in spotlights. The beams seemed to allow the stone to glow, and although they weren't red, the windows and archways did not catch the light and he found blackened features disquieting. The shadows gave the tower life, a face, and Chinnery felt the eyes looking right at him. Some moments later, he had returned to his bed and lay facing the wall opposite. The duvet was now wrapped tightly around his legs, and he shrunk into it. He surveyed the blurred vision of the room, unable to understand why he felt the sensation of eyes upon his back but the room was quiet, and he was very much alone. He lay still, slowly allowing himself to go limp. And if he did dream again that night, he was not aware of it come the morning. Chinnery awoke the next day to the sound of bells pealing out of the central tower. He pondered the unease of the night before, and his now alert and rational mind could only recall an imagination running wild. His trepidation of returning to the cathedral now seemed downright silly. Things in dusk or by lamplight can take on a sinister tone, but in the brightness of day, he felt completely comfortable. Indeed, now, the cathedral seemed positively welcoming and ready to give up its secrets to those who were clever enough to look for them. The impulse, of course, was to return there right away, but he was committed to his engagement in Newcastle and he was nothing if not a professional. If he canceled at such short notice, his reputation might be forever tarnished. And for what? A gander around the cathedral? Some research and possibly a spot of writing? Hard to explain that to anyone, never mind the event organizer. No, he would honor his commitment and return later that day. His original itinerary had not accommodated a return trip to Durham, and after his talk was over, he was to train back home. Instead, he decided that he could simply get off at Durham and foot the additional tickets at his own expense later. Yet, even after arriving at these new details, the talk still felt very much like an inconvenience. It's not that he didn't enjoy public speaking, quite the opposite, in fact, but it was so rare for inspiration to come and figuratively smack him in the face. Better still, it would be quite a treat to write an introduction to this hypothetical new novel with the origins of how it came to be, how he unearthed the secret of Durham Cathedral. Although he hadn't quite done that, had he? He still needed to confirm some facts and perhaps look at the original manuscripts himself so that he could justifiably say that he'd done all of this on his own. And more importantly, there was the doubt that Nicholas Verne really was buried in the already occupied tomb. It wasn't exactly important to his fledgling story, but he sought closure. His initial frustration was later exacerbated when he was introduced to his audience as Britain's answer to George R. R. Martin, a frequent comparison that he felt was hackneyed. He felt most people only seemed to know authors whose work had been adapted for the screen. 
the audience also seemed destined to try his patience. Comprised mainly of writers, the post-speech questions consisted of variations of how they themselves could secure their own agent, eyes glistening with the hope that they were on the verge of uncovering the industry's big secret. So when the last of the books had been signed, it took Chinnery less than 20 minutes before he was back on the train for Durham. When the train arrived at the platform, it was five to four, and the night was settling in. In the end, his late arrival at the cathedral was almost perfectly timed as he appeared to be the only public visitor at such an hour. Inside was all light and shadows, and the voices of a choir filled every corner, enchanting even his own cynical ears. He caught the sight of the familiar verger walking a priest out of the building, and so took a pew to admire the performance while he waited. The choir consisted of students who rested their school bags against the stalls. Although they sounded magnificent, a man shot of a conductor stopped the students frequently to give instruction and to chastise. He was incredibly well-spoken, and Chinnery surmised that his harsh treatment was payback for all the lonely years in public school. Eventually, he relented and allowed the choir to sing two hymns uninterrupted before they bowed and he gave them permission to leave. Chinnery smiled at them as they passed. Mere minutes passed before Chinnery grew impatient for the verger's return, and he made his own way to the hidden tomb. As he stepped up to it, he felt something quite strange. A chill suddenly set upon his shoulders as if something had sucked the warmth out of the air. He became aware of the slight draft he had experienced the day before. Ignoring it as an ordinary thing, he discreetly shifted his shoe to catch the corner of the rug and lift it. But the thin, dusty thing seemed stuck to the marble floor. Are you down there, Mr. Vern? Chinnery half whispered. He was not aware of his intention to speak until he had done so. But in response came a gruff voice behind him. Excuse me, sir, but the cathedral is closing now. A tall porter in his late twenties stood apologetically as he noted Chinnery's startled expression. He was interrupted by the sudden approach of the verger, who moved with such speed that it seemed as if the cane was hardly needed at all. It's fine, Philip, he said, somewhat out of breath. This gentleman is with me. You get yourself away. The porter seemed to consider this instruction before nodding. They both watched the porter walk away, and when he was out of earshot, the verger spoke. Poor man has a pregnant wife at home. He doesn't have panic about her. Wait, he's just leaving us here? asked Chinnery. Only for a few hours. I said I'd watch the place for him. Really? Chinnery remained unconvinced. Safeguarding a cathedral was hardly covering a shopkeeper's lunch break. You work here long enough and they allow you a great deal of trust. It's far easier for them to allow me a bit of responsibility than to do things properly. The closing cathedral doors echoed through the stone walls, followed by the rattling of the keys on the other side. The prospect of being effectively locked in had not occurred to Chinnery. He'd assumed the place would have stayed open until much later. Although he had planned to spend an extra couple of hours if he'd gained access to the manuscripts, he felt it a little restrictive to know that he had to stay here until the porter returned. He looked down the nave, and despite the presence of his companion, he felt incredibly small and isolated. See, the verger confirmed, just the two of us. So, tell me, good sir, what did you think of my research? Chinnery put aside his anxiety and swung his satchel off his shoulder and gave him the notepads. You know, I was surprised he replied, immediately regretting his choice of words. It was true he hadn't expected the verger to be so learned. I, I mean, that is to say, I hadn't expected such a scandal. The verger laughed. <laughs> no, not what I expected either. I mean, 
Usually the church's idea of a scandal is an illiterate bishop or two, but this... Hmm, this is something else. With a wry smile, the verger tried to offer a gesture that made it seem as if an idea had just struck him. But the man was evidently a poor actor. It was clear he had been leading to this moment since the author first approached him. So, what do you say? He muttered, nodding his head in the direction of the rug. Shall we have a look? There was silence for a while between them, while Chinnery considered the question. Somewhere far off, an owl called into the night. At last, Chinnery decided to call the man's bluff. You must be pulling my leg. I wouldn't dream of it, the reply didn't miss a beat. This is what you wanted, isn't it? Chinnery looked down at the marble floor and followed its green patterns until it reached the rug. Well? After a deep breath, he made his decision by asking himself the following question. Would he regret not doing this? The answer was an emphatic yes. I suppose I've come this far, he said with a shrug. Excellent, responded the verger. He immediately ushered Chinnery toward the tomb completely in control of the situation. In the dead of night, every sound within the high stone walls had its own resonance, and the tapping and squeaking of their shoes seemed impossibly loud in the silence. The author squatted and managed to get a decent grip on the rug, lifting it up. Underneath lay a relatively new and rather large piece of plywood, which was bolted into the ground with large golden screws. And as Chinnery began to roll the incredibly dusty rug up, which felt like it could snap, it was that old, it became apparent that the wood entirely covered the tomb. Health and safety, insisted the verger. The remnants of the brass around it are quite uneven. Somehow Chinnery doubted him, and had his curiosity not rewarded him so well so far, he would have replaced the rug and demanded to leave right then and there. The chill bellowed through the cathedral once more, strong enough this time for Chinnery to actually hear it pass by. In his peripheral vision, he noticed the verger take a step back. Gets pretty cold in here, doesn't it? It does that, the verger said, clearly preoccupied. Here, here. You'll need a screwdriver for those. And quickly, he took his leave. He wondered if the verger was having second thoughts, and as he waited, he looked up and glared at the stone faces of the walls as they looked down at him. Manipulated by the shadows, their smiles seemed downright malevolent. Eventually, they won the staring contest. The breeze became an outright gust as it funneled through the tunnel of the choir aisle, and he began to wonder where exactly it had originated. He turned his face away from it, just in time to see the candles down by the pews snuff out. He swayed on the spot, so strong was the pressure, and then another sound could be heard among the wind, a sound that began to make Chinnery feel very uncomfortable indeed. A soft whistle seemed to emit through the aisle, and it took a moment to locate the noise at the organ pipes that surrounded him. Whispers of their tones escaped as the air rattled them to life. The tones were fleeting, and the wind began to die, moaning past him until it became a sound so unlike wind, a sound so desolate to his ears that he wondered if he could stop himself from calling out. In the gust's dying throes, the vision of the cannon's body hanging from the tree rushed back to his memory. Jesus, he exclaimed. He looked up and noted one of the many crosses above him. The blasphemy was not lost upon him. Some minutes later, the verger returned, himself looking a little paler than he had before. I take it you heard it, Chinnery asked, somewhat in disbelief of the events. I heard the wind... The verger stated, 
an explanation that fell uneasily on Chinnery's ears. He passed him a simple, flat-headed screwdriver. This is the best I could find. Chinnery took it, considered asking if they were both sure they were comfortable doing what they were about to do. But before he spoke the words, the idea of backing out now seemed as alien to him as excavating a tomb would have done yesterday. Even in this brief moment of deliberation, he saw the signs of frustration appear on the verger's face. As such, he got on his knees in front of the plywood. Well, the screws don't look too tight. Besides, there's a couple here that seem to have come loose on their own anyway. Had he have turned around, he would have seen the panic draw on the verger's face as he took a step back. He expelled little effort on fastening the screws, yet the beginnings of sweat had somehow appeared on his brow by the time he began to finish. Something felt wrong, and his resolve began to waver. But something at the back of his mind was urging him to hurry. He turned to voice his concern to the verger, but noticed he was gone. No doubt in search of better tools in the porter's office. Chinnery waited for his companion's return, desperate for an excuse to stall his curiosity. Then, looking back down the tomb, he shook the last glimmer of sanity from his mind. Just one little look. He worked his fingers under the tip of the wooden panel and gingerly lifted it up with a grunt. He saw some shapes in the darkness of the tomb, which he guessed to be four feet or so deep. Shifting to move his shadow out of the way, he peered into the blackness and allowed his eyes to adjust when he saw something that made him quiver. Something lay in the tomb. Chinnery had expected to see remains of not one, but two men. But something inside seemed to heave and shiver. Could it be rats? His body began to stiffen at the thought. The idea of such things mere feet away from his flesh was repulsive. He listened. Perhaps there would be the telltale sound of squeaking. But no such noise came. Instead, the movement below was that of a shuffling of something, of bones rattling together. Just as he began to wonder if he had disturbed the remains somehow, the maligned image of a hand rose quickly from the darkness and landed with a tight grip around his ankle. Chinnery screamed. The hand could not have possibly belonged to something still living. The skin was no more, and the muscles withered and so thin that the bone underneath had begun to pierce it. Yet it gripped so impossibly hard, with the strength of a man twice Chinnery's size. In his attempts to kick off the ghastly hand, he fell backward, letting go of the panel. It didn't land loudly on the stone as it should have, but instead hit something softer. From out of the tomb, a terrible figure emerged. It crawled along the floor, squeezing itself from under the wooden board. The sound of its remaining ribs scratched along the marble. There was no face where its face should have been, but instead, the flesh had rotted away, leaving only dusty remains of muscle and veins dangling in patches across the bone. And where there should have been eyes were only dark, empty sockets. It reached once more for the author's ankle and missed as Chinnery was somehow able to shuffle away. In response, it opened its jaw, ripping the last tendons of flesh apart and let out the hideous rattle that was all too familiar to Chinnery now. With it, the breeze began again, carrying forward the most horrible smell of rotted flesh that forced itself into Chinnery's nostrils. The remains lunged forward, successfully grabbing his leg. Its steel grip did not relinquish. It reached with its other fleshless arm, clamping onto him. Dead hands gripped and cut through his trousers, deep into his flesh, and then began to pull him into the tomb. Chinnery opened his mouth to call to the verger, but through his shaking lips, only a stammered, muddled cry of help came out. 
His sweaty hands could find no purchase as they slipped across the marble. Now his legs were inside the tomb, and with a final ferocious pull, he was dragged in completely. He landed heavily on something sharp and wet. In the last moments of light, through an extremity of terror that he didn't realize was possible for any man to endure, he saw masses of bones all around him. There was not two men buried here, but scores. The wooden panel landed with a bang. As Chinnery sank heavily into the sea of bones, his screams, muffled to the outside, would become silent once the rug was pulled back over and would go unnoticed by the passing families the next day until the cries extinguished completely. Far off, in the cloisters of the cathedral, the verger sat on a stone bench and made the sign of the cross over his chest. He exhaled loudly, watching his breath evaporate into the air. How many more, he wondered, before it would finally leave him alone. Thank you for listening to today's episode of The Wicked Library. Stay tuned for an interview with the author after these brief credits. The Wicked Library is a Ninth Story Studios production, ninthstory.com. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash wicked library. You can be a part of helping us keep the show coming for as little as $2 a month. All supporters get wicked fun rewards like bookmarks, access to our archives, bonus stories, and more. The more generous you are, the more wicked the rewards are. The Wicked Library is sponsored by the Legends, Myths, and Whiskey podcast. Brought to you by a team of storytellers and whiskey lovers, they bring culture to life through storytelling every week. You can find them over at legendsmythsandwhiskey.com and, of course, in iTunes or wherever you subscribe to your podcasts. Also sponsored by Zombie Lips. They make the antidote for the human condition, a topical application that cures eczema, poison oak, poison ivy, acne, bee stings, bug bites, cuts, scrapes, scuffs, tears, the endless ailments we wish never happened. Get the cure at zombielips.squarespace.com. All audio recorded in-house at Ninth Story Studios is recorded on Rode microphones. Find out more information about their great products over at Rode.com, which is R-O-D-E dot com. A big thank you to Rode for helping us make the show sound so good. Complete credits and full show notes can be found at thewickedlibrary.com. You can also find links to our Twitter, Facebook, and iTunes page. Don't forget to rate and review the show. And now, an interview with the author. So welcome back to the Wicked Library, Mark. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Everybody, this is Mark Nixon. If you didn't know, he's from England. (laughs) Hello. (laughs) Where about are you from? I always forget. Um, County Durham, which is the northeast of England, not um, not too far down from Scotland. Nice. So, is that the Durham that's also in the story? That's right. Whoa! I have lots of questions about that. But first, I wanted to let everyone know that uh, you actually have had previous Wicked Library episodes. In particular, uh, Double Dread which was episode 602, and then you were also in one of our Chris Massacres, correct? I was not in the Chris Massacre. You I was were. meant to be. It was on the website. Dan, update the website. <laughs> I think I was meant to be, and then my um, my twins came along. That is perfectly understandable. How is life now <laughs> that you have twins? <laughs> so sleepy. <laughs> So, okay. I don't speak Latin. How do you pronounce your title? Quem Infranos. Oh, that is fancy. So tell us more I don't about speak quim. Latin either. It sounded good, though. <laughs> I, I was just going to, like, pull out a Quem Infranos. 
because that just makes it sound like I'm I'm attempting harder. <laughs> um, I am curious about where this story began. I actually remember it was either on Instagram or Facebook or something when you were like hanging out around that cathedral and working on your story, and I was like, man, that's so exotic. I wish I was in England working on stories. But um, where did this story start for you? Uh, well, um, so it was the anthology that came first, and I was just kind of recruiting writers to the anthology, and Shadows at the Door attracts people from all over the world, and ultimately when the right writers were assembled, um, I just decided that it, it's such a shame not to take advantage of of the uniqueness that everybody brings to that. So I thought I would lead by example by setting mine in Durham, and to my knowledge there are no ghost stories set in Durham, <laughs> any fictional ones anyway. And the cathedral, I mean, if um, it dominates uh, ev- everywhere in Durham, you just see it wherever you are, and it just it seemed like a complete no-brainer to write about it because I'm, I'm fascinated by it. How much of the history that's in the story is actual history, and how much of it is imagination? There's a there's a great deal of, of real history in it. Um, the, the sanctuary door knocker. Um, I think that's what usually sticks with visitors when they come to the cathedral. How um, anyone who committed a crime in Durham, if it was well, if it was very serious, you can go and knock and claim sanctuary with the monks there for a while. That's real. Um, the so the tomb that features in the story, the first guy who's buried there is real. Uh, the second guy is completely my invention. <laughs> I imagined, <laughs> but, but you never there's... know. <laughs> Well, yeah, the thing is, I spent so much time, like, I even wrote some of it in the cathedral, and whenever I go there now, I just, I don't know, I just, I'm absolutely convinced that there's, a, there's like a demon in the tomb, and when a friend goes, oh, I'm off to the cathedral, I'm like, okay, watch out, though. <laughs> this thing I wrote may or may not come after you. <laughs> but I'm sorry if it does. Slash not, because then it, I know I was just tapping into the truth. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> Imagine if you saw that news, like, oh my god, that's terrible, but pretty cool. <laughs> It'd be pretty twisted, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I would also uh, have a similar, uh, even across the pond reaction, just be like, oh my gosh, Mark was right. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, watch out. Actual demons. <laughs> I then have to write stories where I become incredibly wealthy and just see what happens there. See, I, th- I think you might be onto something. The secret to the perfection of life is that you just have to write it. That's all. Uh, hang on, no, in my look, though, it would be like a monkey's paw thing where I'd get rich because someone I care for died or something. Yeah. <laughs> when you tap into evil, evil kind of taps into you. I mean, yep. It has to come from somewhere. It's not just going to magically appear. I mean, it- I feel like it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So how long did you spend um, researching and prepping for this story? Too long. I, um, I dare say I procrastinated, but it's such, it's such a magnificent place. It's on my doorstep. And I think I, I hadn't been in there for years and I just forgot how amazing it is. And um, I almost feel like I have to apologize to the people, the, the staff at the cathedral because the vergers are so helpful um, if they see you just wandering around looking at something they'll come and tell you all the stories from the cathedral there so naturally I had to make one of them evil and include them in the story <laughs> Was there a particular person that you based it off of or just a general? I I wanted to um, kind of the re- the virgin in the story is completely fictional, but there is one guy who had a cane that was so polished that, um, in, like, if the light caught it, it would really just—you would see him from way across the nave. <laughs> so that's the, that's the only aspect that's real. I like that. That particular detail added a lot of. Mm, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. Life, I guess, to well, the virgin on the page. Um, at, with this story, what do you think was the most difficult part of bringing it together? Um, I knew how I wanted it to end. Um, I knew how I wanted it to begin. I had no idea how it was going to happen. Um, 
for a long time, um, actually, the the um, chinnery was going to actually break into the cathedral at night, um, and the verger was going to be less involved. And then I would I was literally spending time in the cathedral while they were locking it up and seeing what would happen. And then I was literally asking people, I was like, so um, where are the entrances? Where, uh, is there a security guard at night? Um, is it just a lock or is it a swipe key? And then I thought, shit, if, if someone ever breaks into this place, I'm going to be top of their list. But yep. <laughs> I soon realized that it would be because there's a security guard at night. Uh, all the doors are actually really technologically advanced. So I thought, no, that was a dumb idea. So um, <laughs> it forced me to relook at it. And then, and then it all came together um, when I realized that I could make it even more sinister. Yeah, I it did add to the sinisterness of it because it I think in a way if he had broken in it would be almost like just this feverish like he's already possessed whereas this way it's just curiosity he's just curious and he just climbs a little too far in <laughs> yeah that's it and I kind of I give him chances to uh, I, I give him chances to kind of change his mind so he kind of sort of deserves it a little bit I definitely think so he like the moment where he's getting all like haughty about the lecture that he was doing I was just like okay I'm a little less invested in you now because you're being mm-hmm. kind of a brat <laughs> <laughs> and so that's it added to it <laughs> yeah I, I all my I, I kind of noticed recently that a lot of my characters there's at least one part of them that I deliberately put in that is unlikable. <laughs> what kind of traits do you like to uh, pull out of them that in particular you dislike in normal people? Oh, what, 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 what do I dislike in people or what do I put my characters in, sir? Uh, I guess what dislikable traits do you like to add to your characters? Snobbery. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> A lot of the stuff that I like to read, um, even before I was writing, it's I love like a ghost story where like guys meet in the smoking room of a gentleman's club or something. Mm-hmm. Um, very like Susan Hill kind of, or M.R. James stuff. And um, when you have characters like that who are highly educated or wealthy, there's always a bit of snobbery in there. And I kind I kind of like writing that. So what um, what other books have been an influence as far as that goes? Or writers, or media. I think most people who are familiar with M.R. James, when they've read Quimmin for Nos, they the first thing they've said is it's very Jamesian, which is, um, th- I think that's quite a huge compliment because um, if you ever read any James, his stuff is just incredible, and it was kind of, I think my style is just a lot like his, but um, the language is a lot more accessible, which is a nice way of saying I'm just not as good a writer as he was, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, definitely. But then also, um, Susan Hill is a big influence for me, um, and Stephen King as well. That makes sense. I can see those elements of it in your writing. Like, I enjoyed how in the beginning of it, you allowed the grandeur of this place to really be fleshed out, because I've never been there. I Honestly, I didn't see a picture of this cathedral ever until I looked it up because of this story. It's just like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. Nailed it. <laughs> so what, the you. image that you painted in my head was the first time I ever saw that cathedral. So I, I enjoyed that you allowed us to be immersed in that before you went deeper into the actual like human side of the story. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's really, thank you. That's really kind. Um, I, I was quite convinced that the cathedral itself was going to be a character in the story as well. I think it was in some ways. Because at first I really... I think what I liked about this story was I I did not expect that ending. I really didn't. I enjoyed how, as you were going into the story, it could be like maybe the Verger's kind of someone who's doing something shady, which he was, but not in the way I was expecting, or like it's haunted or something. It was it was there were all these different elements to it that you kind of played with the reader or the listener in this case um, before. You really got to what the big secret was. I, I enjoyed that. Were there certain things that you picked out as you were writing to kind of play with us that way? Um, definitely, yeah. I, um, 
I think particularly when he's kind of debating whether to open the the tomb, and um, when ultimately the like the, the ghoul kind of pops out, I kind of wanted to give you the impression that he was going to get away. Uh, at one point, it swipes for him, and he finally ma- manages to get some purchase on the floor, and he scoots away. Um, yeah, that's. I think that's probably the main part I tried to do that as well. Also, I think I tried to make Chinnery less um, relatable, as we've already said, as the story went on as well. I think you succeeded with that. Um, with your other stories, do you... I, I mean, I've read a few of your other stories, but for the, the folks who haven't, do you tend to play <laughs> with uh, characters that same way, where you kind of, like, dangle hope in front of them <laughs> throughout the story? <laughs> I, I kind of dangle more hope now. Um, a recurring character of mine, uh, Professor Troughton, his first story, I actually killed him at the end. Oh, spoiler alert. And, um, but people really resonated with that character. So um, he actually, in in the next story, it's just revealed uh, that he survived it. And it was just more of a, a near-death experience. Um, and then since then... I kind of like to leave things open a little bit more just in case, a little bit more ambi- ambiguity. Do you um, revisit characters a lot with your stories? No. Um, I am a strong believer that you should only supply demand. Um, mm-hmm. I really hate it when, you know, like a film comes out and they're already making the sequel before they've even seen the reaction. And, and the same with books. I'm, I would only kind of, I only revisit characters if I feel like there's a demand for it. You know, like, Dan Foytek only wrote more of the lift because people resonated with it. Mm-hmm. It resonated with people, sorry. Definitely. And I'm glad you mentioned the lift because you've been writing episodes for that as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm on to three now. Uh, four if Dan has his way. <laughs> How has... Um... Writing for the lift and writing for like your anthology for Shadows at the Door kind of differed in how you approached it. Well, um, I was really lucky because, um, unless I'm mistaken, I was the first person to write Victoria who wasn't Dan. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a huge honor. But um, I really wanted to get the character right because I thought if somebody ever wrote uh, Professor Troughton and got him wrong, um, I would be unhappy with that. And I think one thing that really convinced me to do it is Dan had picked up something that he'd noticed about Troughton. And I thought, well, obviously this guy respected my character that much, so I need to do the same with Victoria. Um, so we're respecting the rules, the lore of that world, but um, it, it allows me to go less dark. In fact, actually, the second story I wrote um, was an all-out horror story. And I don't actually, looking back, I, I feel like it doesn't fit in as well as the others. The first one's a morality tale. The third one is a, is a, not a horror at all. It's um, it's actually a LGBT story, which I'm really proud of. Um, so it, that's allowed me to explore a little bit more different aspects of my writing. And I think I would stay away from horror now um, if and when I write for uh, Victoria again. That's interesting. Is that because she allows you to have a voice in a different world? Or because, I don't know, what? why? Why? I think she just, um, without sounding pretentious, when you explore the character a bit, I think what I was writing before, like the the ghost stories, it just didn't it didn't fit her entirely well, um, and the character is is she's not black and white. There's a lot of uh, gray area with her. So when you explore that, I don't know. I just felt like it deserves something a little bit more in depth. I think that's really interesting because. Victoria, I, I've noticed the same thing because I've been working on a story for that as well. And uh, it's she works really well with horror, but at the same time, she has so much more hope in how she approaches the situation that it almost doesn't quite fit sometimes. Um, and yet she can still bring about really spooky stories like the most recent one. My goodness. Have you listened to that one yet? I haven't, I haven't, I don't sleep. I haven't had much time to catch up. I, I imagine. I, I imagine the only time you can probably listen to podcasts is like if it's in your earbuds while you're like changing diapers or something. <laughs> well, I've actually been catching up on, on the commute to my day job as well. That's how I've been catching nice. up with the ninth story. So, so okay, to untangentalize. I'll bring us back to Shadows at the Door, 
Mark. Hey. So um, you got the book out. I finally got my copy. I was really excited when we got those. They're gorgeous. I, I've already Thank I you. told the internet that already, but if they hadn't heard, they're gorgeous. Everyone should go buy copies of the Shadows at the Door anthology. But uh, so you wrote this this particular story specifically for that anthology. That's right. Yeah. And do you anticipate trying to make another anthology as as life moves forward? Uh, people are already asking me to. Um, <laughs> nice. So, so I think certainly um, a lot of the people who backed very early, um, people who knew they were going to back before they even saw the the, um, the begging video, as I like to call it. Um, uh, it's just um, if it makes the money to fund more then definitely uh, if not um, the website will always exist as it is um, I've also got like half a dozen projects um, in mind but I think you're you're probably very much like me where you can um, you get a bit excited you plan all these things and then you have to pick one to really focus on but um, at the moment I have to kind of and I know I'm joking about it but I have to kind of put myself in the real world in a minute and get used to uh, my new my new life as, as it is and then um, see how it goes but uh, yeah I've got like five stories in my head already that I want to work on um, and definitely yeah, there would be another shadow. the whole point of the anthology was to, was to kickstart Shadows at the Door as a small press so I'll be Thanks. damned if we only do one book yeah <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm excited to see what you end up creating in the future. Thank you. So, Mark, tell us about the website redesign you're doing for Shadows at the Door. Yeah, so um, so because the anthology is selling quite well, uh, I had a really pathetic shop, which was a link to a PayPal account on the website, and I, I, I was looking at website providers that would create a much more professional shop, um, and then I kind of wanted to start... Um, giving back to Barney Baduano who illustrates a lot of the stories already um, and he's, he's going to continue to do so so I thought I want to sell his prints so he can make some money off this as well and then the existing provider of the website was starting to really raise the prices so I've just completely swapped to a new provider um, however because of um, the twins coming it's had gone a bit of a it's had gone a bit of a back burner and it's just enough for me to get books that I'm selling off to the post office. But massive redesign of the site. It's going to look really fantastic. Um, so it's not just going to be stories now. We're going to be going into uh, blogging as well. We're going to be reviewing um, you know, books that come our way. And, and also we're going to be really... I think if there's one thing that Shadows at the Door has really clicked with people who are after more subdued, you know, more pleasing terrors than a horror story... So we're going to start recommending things to people. Like I read a book the other day called uh, Thin Air, uh, which was fantastic, and I think readers of the Shadows of the Dark would love it. So I want to get that out there. Um, I yeah, and um, I also wanted the site to look a bit more pretty because why not? Um, so I've teamed up with another artist who is okay. I think you might have heard of her. It's me, everybody. <laughs> Yay. I also do art. You may not know that by this point. You might be new. Welcome. <laughs> you yeah. can use that as a quote, by the way. Jeanette, she's okay. She's okay. She's doing some art stuff. Good job. <laughs> yeah, the stuff you've done so far is incredible. So, um, Thank you. And even though your style is quite different to Barney's, because we're, we're kind of... Is it a spoiler to say that we're sticking to black and white? You know, it's all it's all looking fantastic so far. So, But I don't want to put the site out there until it, it, it's going to be great, because I want it to be too... I'm going to... I'm going to get in everyone's nerves. There's going to be a lot of fanfare when it comes back, and um, <laughs> it's going to look awesome. I, I'm excited. All, I mean, even the new splash page, which everyone should go check out and then buy a book copy so that we can, you know, make more of these. Um, I already think it looks great. Plus, I'm really excited about what we've been making together already. Yay! So, in the interim of getting your website up and into the world, where can people reach out to you, Mark? Well, um, I am most easily reached on Twitter, um, which is either um, at Shadows at Door or at Mark underscore Nixon underscore. Um, there's the um, Shadows at the Door Facebook page and also Shadows at the Door at gmail.com. But if you go to Shadows at the Door.com, there is also a contact form there as well. 
Twitter's always the best way, though. I'm never off Twitter. <laughs> it's hard to ever get off of Twitter because it's just like constant communication, well, you which I love. You feel like if you don't go on it for a few hours, you've missed a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have. <laughs> And along with talking to Mark Nixon online, you should definitely check out more of his work in past episodes of the Wicked Library, which you'll find in the show notes on our website, as well as The Lift, Victoria's Lift. Go listen to it. It's awesome. And there's some really, really solid episodes written by especially Mark. (laughs) Thanks for joining, Mark. Thank you very much, Jeanette. Thanks for the kind words. You're welcome. And everybody, this voice that you've been listening to is Jeanette Andromeda. You didn't know that. Now you do. And you can find me on horrormade.com. <laughs> Yay! We did it. Also, <laughs> a ninth story podcast where I do more interviews with horror authors exactly like this, just longer form. So you get more rambling. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> From the United States, five stars from Ontario. Awesome podcast. I'm a big Tales from the Crypt fan. This podcast reminds me so much of the introduction. I love it so much. I just started listening Friday evening. I didn't stop till Sunday evening, and I listened to all 55 episodes in one weekend. Well, that's dedication there, friend. I'm glad you enjoy the show that much. We're big fans of the original Tales from the Crypt as well. And it's nice that you caught that that is part of the inspiration for the show. Obviously, we try to do kind of some unique things here, but uh, definitely the uh, Crypt Keeper and the Librarian are friends. From the United States, five stars from Brooks J0639. Sensational. I will listen if my wife is not present in the house, and I think that is the magic in the writing here. I want to see many more episodes and seasons. Hashtag, what was that? Well, I don't know, but it's something behind you, I'm sure. Thank you so much to our current Patreon supporters, Assistant Librarian Scott Jepson, Aaron Vleck, Ada Lee Terrill, Alex Hernandez, Amy Bate, Andrew Dvorak, Bobby Brooks, Brad Erickson, Byron K. Veerling, Cameron Callahan, Chris Brown, Kareen White, Francesca D. Martinez, Gavino Aguayo, James Powell, Jamie Hardy, Justy Hillberry, Kathy Thompson, Kelly Perkins, Lisa M. DeVol, Melinda Dupe, Michael Lusty Smith, Nick Wang, Poo Lee, Robert Light, and Sam Snap. You're the cool kids. Thanks so much for being a part of the show and for making things happen. Until next week, go ahead, leave the lights on. It makes it easier for the corpse under the church to find you.